217th Contact Friday, May 8, 1987, 207 and pages 314-324. Billy says nice to see you again, my friend. I have missed you already. Be welcomed. Quetzal says unfortunately, it wasn't possible for me to come earlier. Billy says it's nothing. It wasn't a reproach, just a comment. If you permit, I would like to begin with some questions. Quetzal says I have no objection to that. Billy says a few questions arouse in reference to the places of fulfillment of guidelines, as you have used these in earlier times to separate the fallible ones from society. How did everything work? Were the fallible ones supervised at the isolated locations or simply left to their fate? How was everything secured, so that these couldn't break out, etc.? Quetzal says the places of fulfillment of guidelines were, in every case, very much secluded from any civilized area. The beginning of these places was, unfortunately, inglorious, for during the first 16 years of their implementation, the fallible ones, each one separated according to gender, were provided with everything necessary for living and learning, set out at the places of fulfillment of guidelines, and left to themselves. However, long-range alert barricades and security barricades were given, so that no one could escape. But this method wasn't sufficient, for since the fallible ones were simply left on their own, several power groups emerged among them, which exercised terror among the other fallible ones. Thus, it led to uprisings and to murder and mayhem, including individuals who rose up against each other out of hatred and revenge as well as out of resentment and for many other reasons. At the same time, homosexual relations and the resulting jealousy also played an important role. Consequently, new ways for the fulfillment of guidelines were sought for the fallible ones, whereby new security measures became effective. So from then on, the places of fulfillment of guidelines were secured by guards who, on the one hand, exercised their waking functions among the fallible ones at the isolated locations and, on the other hand, also outside of these within a particular area. This was the case at least during the first period, which lasted for a few centuries, after which other methods were then brought to application because the direct surveillance carried out by the human guards didn't work satisfactorily. The direct contact of the security guards with the fallible ones at the places of fulfillment of guidelines led to reciprocal differences as well as to reciprocal attacks, through which there were often uprisings and deaths on both sides. For this reason, although other reasons also played a role, new ways were sought, which eventually led to the fallible ones being taken to absolutely secure and electronically monitored locations, therefore, direct security personnel were no longer necessary, and through this, the hazard of collisions and differences between the fallible ones and the guards was excluded. However, in order also to ensure the safety of the fallible ones among one another, so that even among them, no differences and uprisings as well as no power groups would emerge and, thus, murder and mayhem would also be prevented. Our early safety scientists created electronic behavioral chips, that is security chips, which were implanted into the brains of the fallible ones. These chips were designed in such a way that they steered the behaviors of the fallible ones in a way that no aggression and lust for power as well as no hatred and no vindictiveness could appear, rather, everything in relation to this was reduced in such a way that a damping of these destructive concerns occurred, and in each case, all resulting matters were processed in peace and with consideration. Thus, everything was aligned toward the fact that all occurring things and matters were considered thoroughly and rationally and no differences and degeneracies, etc. appeared anymore. But this doesn't mean that the fallible one's own will and their own freedom of choice would have been taken from them, for that was in no way the case. In fact, they were completely free in this as well as in every other form, which also has reference to their freedom of movement and freedom of action. The only restrictions were that on the hand, a secured place of fulfillment of guidelines was given, 
from which no one could escape, and that, on the other hand, no criminal or otherwise degenerative actions could occur anymore because these were prevented by the programming of the implanted chips. The development didn't stand still, however, because the scientists researched further and improved the electronic products, by what means everything became much better. But the real great turning point first came when gene technology was taken into consideration, through which the fallible ones could be treated in such a way that they were separated from their criminal or other degenerative actions and, thus, completely cured of them. This meant that gradually, the places of fulfillment of guidelines became superfluous and eliminated. During the first time, if it was the case that fallible ones were banished for life, without them ever being able to establish contact with the outside world then this measure was gradually relaxed and, in the end, eliminated altogether, once the fallible ones could be completely cured of their criminal or other degenerate forms through genetic manipulation and be released into society. This gene manipulative healing method was further investigated and further developed and indeed even in reference to all hereditary diseases and immunodeficiencies as well as physical and organic deformities, but also in terms of disorders of consciousness and inheritable psychological disorders etc. The development progressed rapidly, so already soon early detections of gene damages of the aforementioned kind became possible which naturally led to the fact that these cognitions were used and the genetic deformities, genetic abnormalities, and other harmful genetic influences were already repaired in the growing child in the womb. Thus, an irrefutable law has been in force since then, namely that every child, so every girl and every boy, is to be arranged into a gene examination, that is a gene analysis, at the prenatal age of seven months. Since then, since this law gained validity and became observed absolutely, it is valid with us that every crime or other degeneration as well as every inheritable disease of the body and its organs, every immunodeficiency of any kind, and every form of harmful aggressiveness, jealousy, and vindictiveness are just as non-existent as also hatred, envy, desire for validity egoism and many other characteristics that bring the human being discord, unkindness, and other harms. But at the same time, it should be noted that through this, our own decision in all matters and concerns is in no way impaired, as well as not our drive for self-preservation and our drive for self-defense, when this is demanded. Billy says thanks. That should actually suffice. On my great journey with Patar, he told me that our scientists are mistaken in their acceptance that in the explosions on the sun, only two million degrees of heat would arise. But unfortunately, I now don't remember what he said, I mean, what degrees of heat he said, which arise in reality. Do you, perhaps, know about this? Quetzal says I am not aware of what you two discussed in this regard, but it actually isn't true that only two million degrees of heat should arise in the solar explosions. In fact, it is around a one billion degrees. Billy says now that you mention it, I remember again. Yes, Patar spoke of around a billion degrees. But now, something else particularly in Switzerland and in Germany, a lot of advertising is always made for how milk should be healthy and a calcium dispenser. However, Patar once said that this doesn't correspond to the truth. I also heard this repeatedly from physicians and scientists. What's up with this? Quetzal says what Patar explained to you and what you've otherwise heard repeatedly about milk is correct. Milk is very well a great source of energy, but not necessarily healthy and tolerable for every person. But in particular, milk may not be awarded those health values that are publicized, for example, by the milk producers and by the responsible persons of the milk industry and other exploiters of milk who produce food and beverages. In fact, milk, particularly cow's milk, contains many substances that aren't exactly to be designated as health-promoting. Unfortunately, also in reference to milk calcium, many erroneous views and assertions prevail, for this doesn't promote bone structure but is truly a robber of calcium, which removes the body's own calcium even from the bones 
by what means there isn't a supply of calcium to the body and the bones through milk but, on the contrary, a removal of calcium. And since, as a rule, too little calcium